Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Thank you to all our volunteers who had the monarch signs outside, so hopefully uh, no one got lost. But if they did, they'll be joining us. To our tech people, do I need to use this, or is this a live mic? And that still can work just fine. I imagine a lot of you know each other over the years because of your engagement in the good work of making the, the planet uh, a better place where uh, we really care for our environment and the species in it. And this is kind of a unique gathering. I know of nothing like it in the 14 years I've served in the, in the, in the Senate. I really appreciate our partners at the Interior Department. Can everybody from the Interior Department, Fish and Wildlife Service, National Park Service, just stand up for a second so we can thank them for their role? Thank you. We know as we go forward, they're going to continue to play just a, an essential role, and they've really been working hard to put this uh, first-of-a-kind event together and to intensify our fight to save the monarch. And we realize that it's not just about the monarch. We have enormous challenges with pollinators in general. We have the challenges of uh, what's often referred to as the insect Armageddon, uh, Europe having some of the same difficulties. I have these memories of when I was a tyke and we'd drive down the north-south freeway in, uh, in Oregon and the windshield would always be covered with, with insects. And we'd stop at every gas station you know, along the way every time we filled up with gas and clean it all off. And today, how, how few insects hit the windshield. This is one kind of small uh, way to think about how the world's been, been changing. But when we rally around a species that is near and dear to our heart, hopefully we will do everything possible to save that species and be able to help do a lot of good work for other species as well. And what is closer to our hearts in the insect world than the monarch butterfly? I mean, nothing in my childhood kind of matched the joy of seeing a monarch fly by and, and whatever child saw it first, ah, it's a monarch. And everybody go, oh my gosh, we know we've always felt like we've always been touched by angels to see one of these butterflies. And we saw them uh, regularly. But uh, they're pretty uh, fragile creatures. Uh, they go through short life cycles, and, and then, uh, you know, on the West Coast, as they go through several generations going north, one generation going south, and they have a longer lifespan if they're overwintering. And that whole cycle has to just kind of keep on going to, uh, to keep the population uh, healthy. And healthy, it is not. Uh, we are roughly at a 99% collapse of the population. In the 80s, it was estimated we had about 4.5 million monarchs overwintering in California. And after the rebound last year, after the rebound, we were still about 1% of, of that number. So a 99% disappearance over a few uh, decades. And the uh, eastern monarch, east side of the Rockies, uh, a significant decline, some estimated 85% uh, decline over the last uh, 20 years. So what's going on? Well, you're the experts. And all of you have conveyed, we have a complex set of challenges, herbicides and that reduce the amount of milkweed, more efficiently uh, uh, farmed fields that leave less sections of weed at the edges, uh, pesticides uh, for sure, uh, just general habitat uh, loss. So we're going to have to have pretty engaged, bold efforts to turn this around. I'm holding a lot of conversations in, in Oregon have been for the last decade about the salmon. Salmon have a complicated trip to the ocean and a complicated trip back. Well, it kind of the monarchs are like that too. They're covering an enormous amount of, of territory and, and a lot of hazards along the way. When I was out at uh, Pismo Beach uh, earlier uh, this year, 
Uh, we were getting filled in on a lot of details. Details, you always learn more when you kind of spend a dedicated time, go someplace. I didn't understood that they overwintered right on the coast because you can't have the overwinter and population freeze and being right on the coast uh, means uh, that they don't freeze. And, but that it also means that if there's uh, hard storms that they're going to really uh, do a devastating impact if uh, fierce storms come in off, off the ocean. And what if those, uh, what if those uh, butterflies, due to climate change, start to head out to their first meal of milkweed and the milkweed hasn't come up yet? Or what if they land on milkweed that has actually been planted that isn't like the native milkweed and it's from South America and it's the wrong milkweed? Or what if that milkweed has been planted by a very good-souled, big-hearted individual who wants to save the monarchs but that milkweed is contaminated by neonicotinoids when it was raised in the nursery, and then the milkweed kills the, the monarch, and uh, so forth. So we have, you know, we have a lot uh, to uh, worry about and a lot to, to work on, and that's why we're all coming together, is to bring the, the best expertise uh, possible uh, to um, put together an action plan that we will have a roadmap on how we go forward to be effective in saving the monarch. And I must say, there are a lot of people ready to help. There are many people who are ready to plant those gardens or already have planted those gardens along the way. But how do we make sure that nursery stock will be, be the right milkweed and, and not contaminated by insecticides? So we have to act now. And um, at this gathering for the next two days, we're looking forward to all of the insights from every scientist, every expert, every citizen advocate who has come, every elected leader, every possible idea so we can evaluate them and put together that action plan. And some of those plans can be done through nonprofit organizations and foundation funding, and some of them can be done by local government, but some of them are also going to require uh, federal regulations or federal laws or federal financing. And of course, I'll be recruiting colleagues on both sides of the aisle on those federal uh, actions, trying to be the best possible partner we, we can. In the bipartisan infrastructure law, a little good, good moment here, it included the Monarch and Pollinator Highway Act that Congressman Panetta and I uh, put together. It secured $10 million to help states and tribal communities carry out pollinator-friendly practices, like planting native plants along our roadsides and highways. And uh, so that's a start, but it's just a very small start. So we have so much more to do, and we must not fail. A couple decades from now, I want the world to say, hey, the monarchs are back, and maybe they'll say they're back because of the actions that came out of these two days, out of this conference, the roadmap that we put together now to make a difference. I'm so encouraged uh, and delighted to, that as a partner in this, we have the informed leadership of Secretary Deb Hallen and her Department of Interior team. Uh, she will be joining us uh, tomorrow morning. So thank you all for being engaged in this effort to save the monarch from perishing from our planet. We have to succeed. That is our responsibility. And now, we're going to hear from our Assistant Secretary for Fish and Wildlife and Parks, Shannon Estenoz. Welcome. Welcome, Shannon. Good morning, everybody, and a happy Pollinator Week. I have to put the right gear on. First of all, let me uh, say again, I'm the Assistant Secretary, I'm Shannon Espinosa, I'm the Assistant Secretary of the Interior for Fish and Wildlife and Parks. So I oversee the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Park Service. First and foremost, I want to say thank you, Senator Merkley, for gathering us uh, here today, not just because you've gathered us together, but you've gathered us together in this place 
um, this place, which is, uh, you know, a, a center of um, authority and government activity and government action, it, it matters that we've chosen this incredibly important place to talk about this incredibly important topic. I, uh, I want to acknowledge that we're joined today by the director of the National Park Service, Chuck Sands, is in the audience today. Um, I am here today, Secretary Holland will be here tomorrow, the director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Martha Williams, will be here tomorrow. Um, this is a, this participation is a, is a uh, should be a, a signal um, as to how important it is uh, to the Department of the Interior that we act together to conserve monarchs and all pollinators. I love Pollinator Week um, because I love pollinators. Pollinators are uh, obviously um, small and folks don't think about it um, in, in terms of the incredible impact that they make. Not only are they uh, critically important to the survival of plant species, but by extension then uh, to the ecosystems that uh, rely on native plant communities, and then of course to our own food security. So they are an economic asset in our nation as well. Um, the monarch butterfly in particular uh, has become a species that people connect with, the public connects with in a way that, um, in, in actually a way that's unique among charismatic fauna um, because we buy greeting cards with monarch butterflies, we have our, they're on our lunch boxes, they're uh, in our jewelry. Uh, people love monarch butterflies. And uh, their story, which isn't uh, understood, this incredible phenomenon, this incredible migration phenomenon that they, that they engage in, isn't, is a story that I think more Americans would find fascinating and we should be talking about it and telling that story uh, everywhere, everywhere we can. Um, the, you know, the other important part of, uh, you know, the public's feelings toward butterflies, and particularly monarchs, is because we encounter them in our lives. We, most of us living in the country, don't encounter uh, other charismatic species like wolves or bears. Uh, if you live in the suburbs, I grew up in Florida, I've, you know, never encountered a, a wolf when I was a, a kid, but monarchs were everywhere. And, and I think that in some ways, the fact that we do see them in our backyards gives us the impression that they're plentiful and common um, when we know, as the Senator mentioned, they have uh, in recent years um, been under tremendous stress and their populations have declined precipitously. Uh, in fact, as all of you know, in 2020, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service did determine that Monarch butterflies warrant listing under the Endangered Species Act. And if things don't change for the monarch butterfly, the Fish and Wildlife Service plans to issue a proposed rule listing, uh, listing the species under the Endangered Species Act in 2024. That is just around the corner. And it's uh, incredibly distressing that uh, a species as beloved and as um, charismatic as the monarch butterfly would be headed for the endangered species list, but it's also an incredible opportunity. It's an incredible opportunity to engage in collaborative conservation um, to not just conserve monarch butterflies, but to conserve all pollinators, and there are many that face the risk of extinction. So whether we are talking about butterflies, bats, uh, bees, hummingbirds, uh, we should be talking about pollinators um, in, in terms of collaborative conservation. So we have the, the opportunity to work with Mexico internationally and very locally. So Mexico, Canada, all the way down to local governments, local community leaders, uh, churches, elementary schools. The, the great news is that literally everyone, whether you live, you are an urban dweller, a suburban dweller, you live in a rural community, um, you can contribute uh, if you are the uh, uh, manager of a lot of land or you're the manager of a single condominium patio, you can contribute. Uh, if you can host the right milkweed plant, you can contribute to the conservation of the monarch. So with that in mind, I want to say thank you to everyone in this room for the work that you have all done, that you all continue to do, you will do in the future, um, federal agencies, NGOs, universities, scientists, experts, um, who have been working together for a very long time uh, to improve the lot of this species and others. 
you know, and, and when I think about monarch conservation, I think it is, there might, may not be another species that embodies the, the principles of President Biden's America the Beautiful initiative than the monarch butterfly, um, precisely because the key to its survival is collaborative. It is um, so inclusive um, that literally everyone uh, can engage. I want to thank uh, the senator for mentioning the bipartisan infrastructure law. I also want to point out that from Interior's perspective that uh, bill has given us some tools in the toolbox, including $1.4 billion in resilience and restoration that we can bring to bear um, in terms of restoring ecosystems and resilience um, for not just pollinators, not just monarchs, not just pollinators, but all species. Um, you know, the Endangered Species Act is an incredibly powerful tool. It is an incredibly successful tool, but it is the nation's emergency room for plants and animals. And we are grateful for the Endangered Species Act, but ultimately we want to keep species out of the emergency room. And we have an opportunity um, in this species in particular to come together and do just that. So the, the sense of urgency um, is really high for this species and for all pollinators. At Interior, uh, we have a number of programs that can contribute to monarch conservation. Uh, thanks to Congress, we have uh, LWC, the Land and Water Conservation Fund, the Outdoor Recreation Legacy Partnership. We have the Urban Bird Treaty, Treaty City Program. We have Rivers, Trails, and Conservation Assistance Programs. We have the Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program. All of these can be linked together. If we can build connective tissue between them, we can leverage each for the benefit of, of monarchs and other pollinators. You know, and I'll, I'll close with this. The good news is that I, as I've been traveling around the country and talking to some of our land managers, parks, national park superintendents, refuge managers, they've got butterflies on the brain, I can tell you that. And it's really great. My most recent trips, just to give you an example, um, the Mississippi National River and Recreation Area. Uh, Flight 93, National Memorial. Um, uh, Patuxent, National Wildlife Refuge. All of them are talking about planting uh, pollinator meadows and restoring areas big and small with pollinator habitat. Recently, the secretary, I joined the secretary to a visit, uh, on a visit to Masonville Cove, which is this wonderful, urban uh, oasis in South Baltimore. And the children there are working on planting pollinator gardens. So people want to help, to Senator Barkley's point, people want to help. We just have to give them the tools to do it. We have to give them the knowledge they need uh, to be value added and to help us pull this species back from the brink. So with that, I, um, I'm going to uh, be with you for a few hours. I, I look forward to learning a lot, and um, I wish you uh, productive deliberations in the next two days, and I hope we emerge with an action plan uh, to bring this species back and keep it out of the Endangered Species Act emergency room. Thank you so much.